This is a story of incredible bravery hidden from the outside world. Go with me! Go with me! Where 3,000 civilians and hundreds of troops have been killed and where children have been targeted. I could hear people's anguish and the cries, it was constant. It's the bloodiest uprising of the Arab Spring. The situation on the ground, it's a crimes against humanity. After Egypt and Libya, will Syria's president be next to fall? Or will the world continue to stand by? <laughs> Tonight, pictures never seen before and testimonies from inside the town where Syria's revolution began. This is Dera in southern Syria. Home to nearly 80,000 people, it used to be a bustling commercial center. Today, it's a ghost town. There are soldiers on the streets. They've set up their barracks in a mosque. Young men from Dera are filming this secretly, risking their lives. Hundreds of people have been killed here. Thousands are missing. For months now, activists have been using tiny cameras, ingeniously hidden in cars and clothes. We're putting the camera into these holes so we can film the security forces around the mosques. They'll be attacking the protesters when they leave the prayers. This young man calls himself Abu Mahmoud. We can't reveal his true identity. He's filmed many protests. This one happened a few months ago at a checkpoint on the edge of Dara. When we approached the checkpoint, everyone was holding up their phones. And opposite us, the security people had their guns. The feeling was, our weapon is the camera and making a record of all this. Without warning, the security forces open fire. One man filming is hit. Thirty people are killed, dozens wounded, on this one day. I was always afraid, fearing death. But what kept me going was the spirit of the people. It made me lose my fear. I've been to the countries bordering Syria, to Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan, to find out what Dera has been through since it defied Syria's rulers six months ago. I've been talking to people who've come out to meet me to victims and to refugees. Witnesses, they say, to terrible abuses back home. The town of Dera is just four miles from the border with Jordan. But this is as far as we can get. Almost all the foreign media has been shut out, barred from reporting what's going on inside Syria. But the people of Dera have refused to be silenced. They've been taking their own pictures. They've been speaking out about the torture and the killing. This is their story. It all began in March at this school in Dera. A group of children, some as young as 11, were arrested for scribbling graffiti, criticizing the Assad regime. They were held for two weeks by state security and they were tortured. This demonstration on March the 18th to demand the children's release sparked Syria's revolution. We've cross-checked all the footage we've obtained from Dera to put the whole story together for the first time. 
On that day, security forces fired on the crowd, killing at least four people, the first to die in Syria's uprising. Thousands of ordinary people took to the streets for the funerals. Now the protests were about repression and corruption. Dera hadn't benefited from the spoils handed out to cronies of the ruling elite. People attacked a statue of the president's father and other symbols of the government. The video shows security forces on rooftops firing at unarmed civilians. More people were killed. One foreign journalist, a Jordanian, had managed to get into the city. At every juncture when the authorities uh, uh, became even more heavy-handed to clamp down on these protests uh, and there were killings, it just, it, it, it almost snowballed. The images that come to mind is a popular, spontaneous uh, uprising. It's just almost like something that you, you read from uh, textbooks about the great revolutions of the world. From the start, the Omri Mosque in Dera was the center of the protest. Posters of the dead were displayed on its walls. A taxi driver from Dera lives near the mosque. He risked his life to meet me on the border. We cannot show his face. He was there on the night of the 23rd of March, when security forces attacked. People came from all across town, and despite the shooting, encircled the Omri Mosque. The crowds grew, and the numbers of security forces grew, and they began to shoot intensively. The attack on the mosque went on for two more days. The young men resisted with stones and sticks. They had no weapons. They didn't have knives or anything. They were just trying to defend themselves with stones. When the army finally seized the mosque, they'd killed at least 60 people, according to local activists. Some of the dead were the wounded being treated inside the mosque. People were afraid to go to the hospitals. Anyone wounded in the hospitals was taken by the security forces. And if he was close to death, they'd just finish him off. Even for those who made it to the private clinics, it was often too late. One man died just after he gave this interview. When the soldiers seized the Omri Mosque, they made their own trophy videos. They were posted online. They swore to fight for the president and the regime, not the people. Bashar al-Assad has led Syria for 11 years, since he inherited the presidency from his father, who'd ruled with an iron grip for three decades. There were high hopes Assad would reform this police state. He trained as an eye doctor in London. With his glamorous British-born wife, the Syrian leader was courted in the Blair years. It's important to engage with Syria, because Syria is going to be an important part of building a peaceful and stable future in the Middle East. But that was all wishful thinking after what happened in Dera. President Assad was quick to claim a foreign conspiracy was behind the violence. It was being carried out by armed criminals and terrorists, he said. 
Did you see any armed opposition within the demonstrations or any criminals or terrorists as the government alleged they were facing? And in the, in the almost two weeks I was there, I only saw more and more ordinary there are residents coming to the streets and that's not just youths, it was women, children, more and more uh, people on the streets. Peacefully? Peacefully, peacefully, not armed peacefully, peacefully not armed. The army's fourth division had been sent to Dara. This unit, commanded by the president's brother, had brutally suppressed political protest for many years. People took extraordinary risks daring to film the soldiers. It wasn't the army as a whole, it was the security forces and this particular division of the army led by, by Mahal Assad. People talked about the ruthlessness, the ugly acts of violence towards protesters. The regime was threatened as the protests spread from Dera to the capital Damascus and then to many towns across the country. Some had a history of rebellion, ethnic and religious tensions. There's more at stake in this revolution than any of the uprisings across the Middle East this year. Syria has influence over fragile Lebanon. And Syria holds the key to peace with Israel. Assad's greatest ally is Iran. And if the Syrian regime falls, it will affect the whole future of the region. I travelled to Turkey and the camps along the Syrian border to talk to an activist from Dera. Omar al-Muqdad is now a refugee here, like thousands of Syrians. But in April, Omar and his secret network in Dera were using the internet to defy the regime. They want to take the revolution offline and they want to finish this by killing people. But the situation in Dera and the ground, it's a crimes against humanity. In Syria, medical staff have suffered some of the most shocking violence. In Dera, security forces even targeted ambulances. And as you see here, this is the ambulance. An activist filmed the moment when security forces shot directly through the windscreen. They shoot him twice. They kill. They kill the, the person inside the ambulance. Yes. The nurse. The, the nurse. The video was smuggled out and posted on the internet. People are desperate, they're shouting, what are yeah. they shouting? They say, this is Dara today, this is Dara today, they killed him. Through March and April, there was a rule of fear in Dara. The security forces stalked the streets. Men were being rounded up for interrogation. Bodies were routinely returned to the families. The Jordanian journalist was one of those arrested. Suleiman was expelled from Syria. But first, he was interrogated in a notorious prison, where many people from Dera had been taken. I saw a young man who had been dangled from his feet uh, with saliva on his mouth, uh, sounds, almost beastly sounds coming out of him. Uh, I saw someone who, who, was, um, who was also electrified. In April, the president promised to lift the state of emergency clamped on the country for 30 years. 
He said he'd bring in reform. But to the people of Dera, these seemed just hollow promises. By now, the revolt had spread to many of the towns surrounding Dera. Demonstrators defied the army snipers on the rooftops. Every Friday after the prayers, the protests swelled. One woman living in America would be confronted by the horror of those days. She'd been visiting her family in Isra near Dera and had seen the crackdown. My father he used to cry every day when he watched the news. He was very scared about me, about the family and stuff, so he told me I should leave the country. Back in the States on April the 22nd, Halla logged into her Facebook. By chance, she found a mobile phone video. Army snipers had killed 25 protesters in Isra, one of them an eight-year-old child. The pictures are too graphic to show. Look at that kid. Halla then realized one of the wounded was her father. This is my father. Look at look at him. He he passed away in the video. Like I saw him when he passed away. That video makes me very upset and angry because I know my father. My father is a very brave man, very honest, and he was shot three times and he doesn't know anything about politics. The soldiers enforcing President Assad's will rarely speak. But in Turkey, I met an army sniper who'd been sent to Dera. Wasim defected and lives in fear of his life. We can't show his face. But I saw his military ID. Wasim thought he was defending his country. The officers were telling us there were armed gangs, part of a foreign conspiracy. We said we want to go to Isra, to Dera. We want to clean it up and kill the terrorists. Syrian state television was showing pictures from Dera. They said these armed men were protesters. But when Wasim got to the city, he discovered these gangs were the Shabiha, or ghosts. Their thugs recruited to do the army's dirty work and act as agents provocateurs. The officer said to us, there are armed groups, but don't shoot at them. They belong to us. There are no rebels or conspirators, only the people. Shoot the people. But we didn't want to. Wasim's unit was sent to Isra, under orders to shoot to kill. One soldier who refused was never seen again. Some of us, we didn't shoot at the people. We were shooting at the walls and up in the air. There was a unit behind us, soldiers from the 4th Division, which is loyal to Maha al-Assad. I mean, if you didn't shoot, they would shoot you from behind. They'd have killed us. Wasim knew he had to get out. He escaped with 20 others from his unit and fled across the border. Other soldiers weren't so lucky as Omar, the activist from Dera, showed me. The soldiers refused to open fire on civilians. They shoot them from behind. It's about 12 soldiers. Here we have eight. And the people of Dera are helping them? Yes, the civilians helping them. And these soldiers, what happened to them? Now, these soldiers, some of them fled out of the country, some of them hiding even now, and I guess some of them dead. Ultimately, it will be the army which will determine the fate of this Arab uprising too. Syria is not like Egypt or Libya, where the army, or a significant part of it, sided with the people 
forcing out a dictator. Syria's army has been carefully tailored over the years to make sure the Assad regime stays in power. To understand more, I was off to meet one of the highest ranking defectors, a Sunni like most people in Syria. Unlike him, 90% of the officers in the security forces are Alawite. They're from the same minority sect as the president's family, and they're die-hard Assad loyalists. I waited in a safe house. The colonel is a wanted man. He just announced online that he and other Sunni officers were forming a rebel army. I sympathized with the revolution from the start. I was under constant surveillance. They have spies in all the military barracks. The colonel and the captain with him confirmed that atrocities by the security forces were taking place in Deira and throughout Syria. I asked him who was responsible. Bashar al-Assad is responsible because he is the head of the regime and of the state, and no decree can be issued without his authorization. This is well known by the Syrian army. It's a dictatorship. More and more defectors' videos have appeared online. Thousands of soldiers are thought to have abandoned their units and joined the protesters. But with so many Assad loyalists, it will be hard to get the army to reach a tipping point. We're counting on defections. There are larger numbers occurring every day. But we know that this regime cannot be taken out without using force. We're now preparing for this stage. You understand? If they don't agree to give up power peacefully, we'll take them out by force. But until that happens, the army will continue to be Assad's instrument of repression. On April the 25th, the security forces were ordered to begin the siege of Dara. Tanks sealed off the streets. <laughs> Homes were blasted with artillery as the whole city was punished for its defiance. Water, food and electricity were cut off. Bodies were stored in refrigerated trucks. It was too dangerous to go out and bury them. Four days after the siege began, villagers around Dera tried to break the blockade and bring food to the town. Again, the security forces opened fire, even though there were many children in the crowd. Nawal al-Shari begged her son not to join the march that day. 15-year-old Tama, like many of Dera's children, had been inspired to join the revolution. His conscience wouldn't let him accept the bloodshed. He kept going out, protesting with the people. Every child and every woman in Syria rose up. Dozens of people were killed that day and scores arrested. Nawal's son was one of them. Tama was taken to the intelligence headquarters in Damascus. There was a witness inside the prison who saw and heard him while he was being tortured. He was calling out for help and shouting, God, freedom, Syria. That's all he said. When Tama's body was returned to the family five weeks later, he'd been beaten. His neck was broken, he had bullet wounds, and he'd been mutilated.
All my son's features were gone. He wasn't my son, who used to be a handsome prince in my eyes. How can I describe how he looked? I mean, don't they have children? Aren't they human like us? The torture and killing of Tama and one of his school friends brought new impetus to the revolution. Across Syria, a hundred children have been killed by the security forces. A defiant regime brought its supporters onto the streets of Damascus in June. The president offered a national dialogue, but the killing went on. We asked the Syrian government for an interview about the human rights abuses in the country, but they did not respond. The pictures taken in Deraa, however, tell their own story. A UN investigation has found there's been widespread and systematic attacks against civilians by Syria's security forces. Many people now believe that President Assad and his henchmen should be in the dock at the International Criminal Court for crimes against humanity. Hala, whose father was killed by an army sniper, is the first Syrian to try and take a case against the regime to The Hague. We have to stop the killing. We need to remove that president. I will keep fighting to the end of it until I see him in the International Criminal Court to justice. When Colonel Gaddafi was ousted in August, Dera took heart. But Syria's Arab Spring is now approaching winter. It will last much longer than Libya's or Egypt's. The international community has condemned the Assad regime and imposed sanctions. But there's no appetite for military intervention. And it's not what the people of Dera want. We need the international community to siege to surround the regime from outside. Because if you cut the financial sources in them, they don't have money to pay for their thugs and their criminals. After five months, the army still occupies Dera. Local activists say at least 600 people have died and 3,000 are missing in the area. The latest pictures smuggled out show the activists are still gathering evidence, still writing graffiti, demanding an end to the regime. Dera's people have suffered, but they're still resisting. God will grant them victory. It started in Dera, and the regime's end will come in Dera. The people of Dera say they won't stay silent, they won't give up, whatever the price they have to pay in blood. Next week, as the national minimum wage rises above £6 an hour, Panorama goes undercover, revealing how some employers are getting round the rules to rip off workers. It's witness some of Scotland's most dramatic moments. Fiona Bruce visits a snowbound palace of Holyrood in Edinburgh. The Queen's Palaces follow next.